Hello, and welcome to this month's episode of the Distance Learning Roundtable on the Incandescent Radio Network and Incandescent TV. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of the show where experts gather to discuss the future of online education. It's an honor to, do, to introduce you to the hosts of the show, Pat Casella, the Executive Director of the U.S. Distance Learning Association, and Dean Hoke, Managing Partner of the International Organization Edu Alliance. Joining us today is the fabulous Lee Gamble. She is the Distance Learning Coordinator and Science Health Instructor at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History in, of course, Cleveland, Ohio. So now I'm going to kick it over to Pat to tell us about Lee and start off our amazing conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Hope. Lee is a longtime friend of the United States Distance Learning Association and is currently a distance learning coordinator in charge of program development for a live presentation to school audiences basically around the world. I mean, you know, it's across the U.S., but also I know she's she's had uh, sessions in over 10 countries. Lee is definitely all about fun and education, which I love producing incredible virtual tours that I like to call virtual field trips, always use that term, throughout the museum and research areas. Lee says, and this is her quote, it's all about skunks in the studio and cameras chasing curators. Kind of love that. In a past life, Lee was with Health Space in Cleveland as a health educator as well as with the Great Lake Science Center as a wizard assembly performer. Great time. Lee has her bachelor's degree from Harem College in Ohio, majoring in theater arts and biology. Great combination. And is a super fun person to be around. I can attest to that. Uh, welcome, Lee. We're delighted to have you with us today. And I am going to turn it over to Dean for our first question. Well, very good. Lee, that major that Pat just talked about, biology and theater arts, that's a bit different. It. Yeah? <laughs> what, for what, for over 30 years, you've been a presenter and an educator in the field of health science, primarily in the K-12 space, both in person and doing video. What led you down this career path? This is a very unusual career path when you put all these things together. It is indeed. And when people ask me, by the way, Pat, thank you for that delightful introduction. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've had many, many odd titles and that's and Wizard Wizard Assemblies was definitely one of them. So, Dean, about how I got started, I grew up out in northeastern Ohio and it was a tiny little community called Roaming Shores, which is now interestingly surrounded by land that is owned by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and stewarded by our natural areas team. So that's kind of a neat thing that I, I didn't know as a kid growing up is that I was living in a place that was soon to be protected and, and nurtured by the, the my eventual employer, which is pretty cool. So as a little kid growing up out in Ohio, I was outside all the time in the summer catching wildlife. I, I thought I was gonna be a zookeeper or a veterinarian, something animal related, because all I did all the time was catch things and put them in tanks and look at them for a while and let them go again. And uh, when I got to college, it became painfully apparent that lab science was not my strong suit. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate those who are good in organic chemistry. I am not one of those humans. So I talked to my career counselor and her suggestion was, well, you like technical theater too. So why not kind of combo them up? Because that way you can do your lights, camera, fun, hanging sandbags, theater stuff not performing, I wasn't looking for performing, but also learn the science. And all of the jobs that I've had have been a really weird combination of those two passions, is helping to create an illusion of something that the audience is looking at, but then here at the museum, that illusion is reflecting reality of the science that is happening at this museum. So that is sort of how it all happened. Okay. Wow, Pat? wow. that was awesome. Um, <laughs> so last week when we first spoke and we were brainstorming about this session, we came up, Lee, you had the term backslash forward uh, when we were talking about distance learning. Tell me the origin of that term and how does it relate to distance learning in Ohio and your life? Well, first of all, I must give total credit to somebody I don't know from the Ohio Educational Technology Conference who came up with that title. I am 100% swiping it. So thank you, OETC team. The full title of their 2023 conference this year is backslash like the actual 
on a keyboard indicator, backslash forward, celebrating the past, creating the future. And when I read that title, I was blown away because it is completely describing what the Natural History Museum here in Cleveland is doing, is we are gutting and transforming this beloved old institution of 100 years into a brand new research and educational facility that matches the future. So we're embracing all the new technologies. And it's just, it, it just, that title screamed at me, use me. <laughs> so thank you, OETC team for letting me borrow that. Um, I love titles that are clever and have some kind of pun. And I'll give you two examples of, of titles that I came up with for programs here. One of them is Human Evolution Following Lucy's Footsteps. So if you know who Lucy is, Australopithecus afarensis, and you might also know that Don Johansson, who was our physical anthropology curator here in 1974, discovered that fossil. There's one pun I enjoy very much. And the other is Climate Changing Our Health whether we are ready or not, whether being spelled as in rain or shine. Clever, clever. I wouldn't <laughs> expect anything less from you, Lee. I do my best to throw the puns in. Part of that That's question awesome. though, you were asking about how the museum is reflecting that backslash forward. Would you like me to elaborate on that just yeah. a tad right here? Yeah, talk about Please. that a little bit. Great, because the whole concept of every program that I've ever done for the USDLA conference or the OETC or any other of the many conferences I've attended is always reinforcing the fact that technology exists to link humans. There is not a robot or a computer yet that is out there doing its own research. It's a tool for us connecting those human researchers. And that's precisely how I feel about virtual field trip technology is that without a really good presenter, your technology is not gonna hold the kid's attention. So that's what the museum has been trying to do is we're not changing the need for excellent teachers or their in-classroom tools because there's so many great in-classroom teachers. We're embracing the new technologies to connect more students with excellent teachers all around the planet. Very good. Perfect. Dean, Re how about let's that? talk Perfect. a little bit about the museum itself and how much it's really changed over the years. I mean, so you say, I'm an old guy. I remember museums from a different era, shall we say. And they seem to have changed so much over time. And recently, ever since we've gone much more into electronics and things like that. Tell me how particularly your museum, Cleveland Museum Natural History has evolved over time. Would love to. And I've heard several other much more versed historians on this topic. So I, I've taken notes. And when I say that, educators here who have done a presentation on the history of this museum. Since I'm a relative newcomer, having only been here for 15 years, when I came on board, there were curators who'd worked here for 45 years plus. And what I'm going to do is give you a quick bullet point rundown of the way that this museum has always endeavored to get its research and its science out to the public. When the museum was basically brand new, it was launched in uh, 1920 as an official entity. Very shortly afterward, 1947 to be specific, they invented the Traveling Trailside Museum, which was basically a sort of a tractor trailer kind of thing towed behind a truck, Good. completely stuffed full of specimens and these beautiful dioramas that were all created by museum scientists. And the idea was it was going to travel within a, an hour or two radius of the museum to locations where people had a hard time visiting us in person. In the first two years of its operation, that little trailer had 38,000 people visit it. So that showed the museum that there was a desperate need by the public to see what we had and also the inability to physically get to us all of the time. They also created the Educator Resource Center, which is a lending library of those dioramas and lots of other teaching supplemental items that are hard for teachers to get a hold of. Things like actual animal skeletons and furs, rock and mineral specimens, tons and tons of items. And individuals or whole schools can be a member of this lending library. It was launched in 1986. And the funny thing was that the Trailside Museum was actually sponsored. I'm looking at my little notes here to see if I've got, no, I don't have the sponsor for that, but the Educator Resource Center was the East Ohio Gas Company and also the Standard Oil Company. So even these, these other companies were recognizing that 
the physical difficulty of getting your science to the public. You got to drive, you got to burn fuel to get there. So as soon as virtual field trip technology was made available, the museum embraced that as well. And that was when I came on board in uh, late 2006 with a merger with the health space building because we already had the equipment that was coming with us in that merger. Um, otherwise, I can rattle off the science to go programs we've done in the past, driving to schools, continuing that tra traveling trailside museum idea. We, um, we have tons of live programs for the public, especially over 2020, when everybody got chased home. We mm -hmm. immediately started broadcasting lots and lots of our programs and our lecturers for nighttime viewers, uh, as well as school programs. So throughout our history, the museum has constantly done its best <laughs> to bring its science to the, to the outside world. Very good. Pat? Very interesting. Yeah, to, to tie into that, Lee, um, let's tell me a little bit more about these remote field trips. Uh, you know, how are they developed? Um, who goes on these, these field trips? Um, are all the participants from the Cleveland region or, you know, are there folks from other places? I've long been a, a proponent of this because I used to sell the technology that, you mm -hmm. know, made it possible. But, you know, tell me a little bit more about uh, the production part. I'd be delighted to. And the funny thing is you, you mentioning or asking, do they do they travel? Is it only Cleveland folks? Right before this interview, I was upstairs in our studios talking to a bunch of high schoolers in uh, Sioux North, Canada, and they were learning about the dangers of tobacco and vaping products. So when you mentioned countries, 27, we're up to oh, 27 man. countries now that our education staff is taught to, plus all 50 states and Puerto Rico, which is really, really fun. How they get developed is us soliciting input from teachers that we have previously taught to because we already have their email addresses. It's easy, right? So you send out a little survey and say, hey, here's all the topics you've booked with us in the past. Is there one you need help with? Inevitably, teachers will definitely give you ideas <laughs> about what they need help for. And I did a program once for the OETC conference where I specifically asked teachers, why are you getting a virtual field trip from a museum? What is, what is the driving force behind that? Is it because the kids need to learn something for a standardized test? Is it just to get them excited about the science? You know, what? And the highest answer constantly was, we want the kids to see how what they're studying in school relates to the real world. Show us real science that is happening using what they're having to memorize. Perfect, perfect match. So that's how we figure out what we're going to write next. And then we start pestering curators for the public who might not know that term curator. That means a person who is in charge of curating or taking care of a specific set of museum specimens. So we have a curator of the mineralogy department, a curator of the mammalogy, a curator of vertebrate zoo, which covers everything with a backbone, that kind of a thing. So we go talk to them. It's kind of like living inside Wikipedia, but every single source is a reputable source. <laughs> that is awesome. And I didn't realize that you're up to 27 countries. That is- How about phenomenal. that? Ooh, can I give you more numbers? I got I got some numbers. Sure Just enough. last year alone. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is it too too soon for numbers? No, go. I want to hear. I have to look them up because okay. I don't memorize numbers easily. Facts, no problem. But numbers, terrible. I looked it up last year. We did 107 programs in the building, physically groups coming to the building that were not a partner program. We did 626 virtual field trips at that same chunk of time. The wow. total with in-house that is booked by a partner program, other stuff, 1,598 programs. Almost half of those were the virtual field trip. That's 46,000 kids <laughs> that all learned from this museum last year and a mix of kids that are local and also around the world. Impressive numbers, Lee, nice job. Dean, on to you. Lee, I've been doing some research on you um, <laughs> on my favorite machine, my Google machine as they call it. And I found out some interesting quotes and phrases describing you. Okay. You ready for this? I'm ready. I'm listening. All right. Here's the terms I read most often. Outgoing, intelligent, strong work ethic, a person who's dedicated to teaching kids everywhere. Now, I must admit, I didn't see you put your name on that, so I don't believe you're the author. I think this is what people have been saying about you for years. Here's my question. What excites you so much? What gets you so fired up about teaching in the unique way you do it? The silence that is happening right now is because I'm thinking 
thinking about something that I heard on NPR this morning was that Bob, I can't think of the man's last name, but the man who played Bob on Sesame Street passed away. Oh, either again. Last I knew him, Bob McGrath. Yeah, he's one of my childhood heroes. It was all those shows that we watched, those people in this podcast right now who are all of a certain age, things we were watching when we were kids, like The Muppet Show or Sesame Street, that got me super excited about teaching in a weirdo way. I didn't want to be a school teacher standing in a classroom teaching to a textbook. I didn't want to do that. I, when I was a little kid, I liked nothing better than to run up to some grown up and say, did you know that a snake's scales are made of the same protein as your hair? I, <laughs> that was what I loved to do. So in shows like, like Bill Nye, the science guy, he was one of my heroes because he was just bah, in your face. Here's some cool science. Learn it. Um, others of my childhood icons would have been Weird Al Yankovic because he was taking a known a known commodity this song and giving it just that goofy little twist more songs i heard his version first and didn't even know there was a real version of this song <laughs> so eugenie clark how about that for a name Ooh, that'd be a trivia for some of our listeners is who's eugenie clark one of the first woman scuba divers and mam and um, marine biologists told marvelous stories like i was driving in my car once and i had a shark jaw sitting on my car seat and i had to fling my arm out to stop it from falling because i had to slam on my brakes and it bit me and that's the only time that I got bit by a shark in my whole career, Eugenie Clark, by a jaw in her car. I love stories like that because it shows just weirdo teachers teaching in very odd places. <laughs> and virtual teaching, VFT, lets all of those things merge. The science and the flash and bang of, of the cameras and everything, it's all together in one handy package that appeals to just about everybody. Well, I also must admit, I think probably your theater helps you a great deal in terms of your own training, in terms of being outgoing and getting across, because I've worked in front of television cameras before. It's not easy to get across what you're trying to do. Enthusiasm only goes so far. There's other things that seem to, <laughs> to happen, and that's you true. seem to have that as a part of it, and I think thank that's you. why people like, the, like you so much. Oh, thank you. I, I could I share one tip right now with the, with not only the three of you, but anybody who happens to see the recorded portion, a uh, video recorded portion, okay. is whenever I do a program talking to my fellow educators in this strange venue, I like to work in one of the simplest tactics that I see so many new folks to the field forget. They forget that who you're looking at is the camera, not the people on your screen. So I'm going to duplicate what I like to know, I, I call this the David Letterman effect, another one of my childhood heroes. <laughs> and uh, here's, here's the David Letterman effect. I'm going to tell you all a joke right now. I'm looking at the audience. I'm setting up the joke. I'm telling the joke and then punchline right at the camera. Right at the camera. You don't have to look at the audience the whole time. As long as you look at that camera during the important parts, it boom, pulls them right back in and they feel like, oh, she's looking right at me, which anybody knows. No, I'm not. I'm looking at the camera, but it, it, speaks to us that your eyeballs are locked onto my eyeballs right now. <laughs> Don't fear the camera, stare at it. <laughs> well, I think you're going to end up working over back at your college again and doing a little bit of theater besides doing science. Oh my gosh. Technical theater is so fun because on a stage, you're hefting sandbags and moving giant panels and everybody's trying to be in the right place at the right time. And that all translates into virtual teaching. You're just oh my gosh, getting the Zoom link ready to go at the right time and getting the room lights on and getting your stuff in position. You know, it's the same, the same kind of skill set involved. Very good. Pat, over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dean. Um, Lee, just fabulous. Um, just great listening to, you know, having this conversation here. And as I mentioned, you've been a, a long friend of, of USDLA. Um, what do you think will be one of the biggest challenges uh, as an educator, um, you know, both now and as we move forward in the future, you know, uh, one, three, five years, right? What do, you, what do you think some of the challenges are right now? My goodness, I would say the number one, for me at least, because I did not grow up with this technology. I think that might be true. I don't like to guess people's ages, but it's possible that all the folks involved with this uh, call right now also did not grow up with a cell phone in your hand. So for me, staying on top of the technology is my biggest challenge because once I once I find something that I'm comfortable with and that I'm good at using, I just want to use that forever. The old workhorse Polycom studios we're using right now, man, those things have been working for 15 years and they're still working and I'm used to them. 
but by attending conferences, by going out and networking with your pals who are also in the biz, you find out about new things that you might want to try. So as an example, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the USDLA conference and there was a company there called Georama. They've since changed their name and I cannot remember what they're calling themselves now. Their whole selling point was, say, are you trying to do live streaming on your cell phone and having problems with your Wi-Fi conking out? Well, we have figured out a way to have it run both the Wi-Fi and the data plan at the same time. So you never have any of those drops in your connection. And that's exactly what we needed here at this old building because we were just in the process of setting up all of our new Wi-Fi access points and there weren't areas in the museum that, that, I mean, that were perfect. You, you would lose your connection. So I got connected with those guys, tried them out for a couple of years. It was super fun. We ended up migrating onto other platforms, but I would have never found that technology if I hadn't gone to the conference and just nosed around and seen what was up. Right. So teachers, you know, they have to stay on top of things, obviously. And they do not only the students, <laughs> but also the technology. <laughs> yeah, well, students are changing. Um, would you say that it doesn't help when the teachers are, as you are, overly engaged with what they're teaching? Wow. Well, that is true. Like I mentioned before, there's no replacing an excellent teacher. Unless you're passionate about what you're teaching, that's going to reflect on your kiddos as well. And certainly in school, there are plenty of subjects that we're not, not everybody loves everything. I'm lukewarm on certain subjects myself. So peer to peer learning can help to bridge that challenge. And the Ohio Distance Learning Association, I've been on their board for years. I don't even know how many years. I can't remember. But, but one of the really cool tactics they use is connecting classroom to classroom for reading projects, math projects, you name it, projects. And that way the kids are having fun talking through Zoom during school time, but working on a school project. And then a lot of those projects are then presenting through Zoom. So even though they're accomplishing learning something in the classroom, and that'll probably help them on a standardized test somewhere, they're also honing their skills to then later be perhaps an engaging teacher via one of these online apps like Zoom as well. So that's what I would say is the biggest is don't be afraid of the technology. And if it is daunting to you, use your students because they're not afraid of anything. <laughs> Let them try it out and see what, what comes what comes of that. Some great advice, Lee, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I What a great conversation, Lee, you are fantastic. Wow, we're so thrilled to have you on the show. Um, and we're really excited to stay in touch with the Cleveland Museum and see what else is happening as the days and weeks and months and years go by. Yes, so we are, this is our first podcast for 2023. So we wish all of our viewers and listeners a very happy new year and stay tuned for more distance learning roundtable episodes coming up monthly. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Mr. Pat. We will talk to you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Lee. Thanks. So